Zwischen Johnny Gull und der Jury Exolmorostik ist. Man muss sagen, dass Exolmor in der Nachschande kann man es kulturell gallig. Er ist nun in der Form, als die Idee ist lernt in Joch. Also ein Höhl. Halliriger, ich habe mich gefragt, ob man hier so viel Trovien gallig. Er ist auch nicht nur so gemütlich, also schön. Han har hållit oss morgon falsch vaka det där så att så exol mor skriver en nörd på när man kan inte gå robot. Är det kanske också falsch att det är att han kan inte erlöna. Falsch det är att gå orat en tull där vi inte fick det så gär. Har sin annan barock tolkare gått norrat ska vi reglera det och lägga en art av schemas marken till jag var gär. Är det nu Jim man är sådan den här kyssningen? Jim Hunter. Skrive dat, er is niet echt drie in mijn ratjoch. Er is bij een tijdelijk aan mijn rigra met je in een herster. Ach, als een dolle man, maar bij wel een tijd voor hoort een hoosjoch, ik kan een jaggen aan een gast in een dorat. Er is zo'n een tijd, er is een violjoch. Ze had zin, James McQueen's Limited, er is haar huis, Limited. Er is bij wel een tijd voor het kutjoch, er hoort de vraag aan de linie, Jeg er færdig med at lære mig. Jeg er lidt ulykkelig og nobel. Har du nu gået en gang hurtigt til en ulle, en jæne hurtigt? Jeg er har sin kommer nok hjem og er sund sjæl. Hvem vil gøre det til en god rock? Og har du skal uras læsere holde mor og stik? Er sund til en klare? Jeg er strøg på en hurtigt. Jeg har gået sin en kærlighed. Nu er jeg har sin mor ikke til at ske og lade nok have en egen hul. Ik heb u hadden verdacht er een waardige show, nu ik eens zo graag een gaster erwijne. Misschien koos ik een hartstikke interactie, ha koos ik kul serieus al, verstuur een dokter Dekker Forrest. Ha Dekker er is een goed prijen, maar Christiane Primroos, het jij niet kent ook gewoon lukt kul ook een fijn enjoyje graag troviant galik. Er is maar jaren de zin, zo'n rast de boeien met je. Er is hem nog eens gehoord Jenny Duncan. Het al die jongens geeft bij kan men horen aan de toeleid. Nog kus je vaartje op een draste. Hallo, vaartje op de wille. Er is een dag de hoogste gegeven draste. Le oren als een skiere zo heen. Ik is een toren zo, een schelting in goed kuiter mag ze wel een tijd. Het is een sloeg, ik is een toerkeren. Ik is aan zijn oren, hij heeft de verhuurdische noorken en achter. Ik is een kalfvat toch, ik is een chile. Ik is een bier, als je een gastje al aan een sleetje. Van een bieden vieler in zijn piepen aan kan glezen, maar hij heeft haar in de graag. Maar zijn zo, oren en noorken. Another gay, good jacket, going in my mother, the mother's the bee. 
Ich bin der Vorstand der Vorstand der Vorstand Thomas Young, the people who are in the people who are in the 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 in het fall om aardjede aan de schaam zo ostig. Zakvetsing groeilijk het jeetmoch heeft me gaalig, 
Scotland's famine winter, is set adrift on the world, the Sutherland clearances. Ach, warok ydy sy'n, mae'r nabyg sy'n gilio'r haedd cwth gymwyr rhy behfwbloch er i eildoch, ys rhy jesbyd mewn lliadwyrd ga coenrch noch gyn dwychol. A iol ys ffarsyn, ys dwy'n, ys biach gyn lleir sy'n ioch egi, chan o'n fain hyf echtri, ach cwdioch hyf ffeimoloch gyn lleisoch i. Nigelstoke, <laughs> Byakwad er echtri sol mor ostek mar eschen plade scho ages mollig gen heim sol mor er kür di lesoge kanan is kulter ne galik ages di lesoge koinschnoch am keinjoch gen hort nora treif ages lesen ke de falsche viol er nart all of schemes machen hawaga Thank you very much, and, and my thanks to all of you. When, when I looked out of the penthouse suite that Evelyn and I have been kindly accommodated in, in the tower this morning, I thought, to be honest, there'd be nobody here at all. So, <laughs> so uh, it's very good of you to make that effort on what's a pretty wild day in my sky standards. So thank you, and thank you. Uh, my lecture is entitled 
like the laverick in the homen, why so modernistic matters. And I'll try and explain where I'm coming from with that as I go forward. And what I'm going to do really, I guess, is talk a little bit, obviously, about why I think Sol Moral Stig, and have long thought Sol Moral Stig is a, an important institution. But the reasons that I think that connect with my own wider approach to the Highlands and Islands past and present. So in a way, it's a kind of personal reflection on various things as well. My inaugural lecture at the UHI Centre for History in Dorna was delivered there in 2006. And it touched in the bygoing on my first visit to Solmarostig, when what's now this college was a set of farm steadings, pretty far gone in decay, crumbling buildings, slates falling off, all of that. I mentioned that and said this, to me, what's been achieved at Solmoor, once a ruin, now a flourishing academic institution, is emblematic of all the many changes for the better that have taken place in the Highlands and Islands in my lifetime. Well, my lifetime's now a wee bit longer, but I'm still of that opinion. And today, I'll try to say why this is so. Some poetry to begin with, and this is where the title comes from. Trower minds were ain our language still keeps rinnin like a tone, like the laverick i the homen shearlin when the day is done, like the seech a wind trow corn at the risin o the moon. It's the screechin o the swabby and the currup o the cra, and the, and the boulder o the water in about the bracken bar. It's the dunder o the north wind when he brings the moor in snar. It's the soon the sheep max nyarmen, when you cut them on a four and the noise of hens are clagging, laying peace eggs in a vor, and the galder at the duggies when a pick comes to the door. Now, composed some 70 odd years back, these verses celebrate Shetland or Shetlandic, and as will be evident to anyone, either here or out in the wider world that might be listening to this, who comes from Shetland. I'm not aspiring to be a fluent speaker of Shetlandic. It's a dialect of Scots in essence, but it's one containing terms from a language now extinct, a language known as Norn, last spoken in the 18th century. An evolution from the Norse that came to Shetland with the Vikings some 12 centuries ago. Norse also heard, of course, for ages around here. For what's Ostig, but Ostvik. One of numerous place names testifying to this island having been under Norse or Norwegian jurisdiction for longer than it's so far been a part of the UK. Language death, something I came up against when in the 1990s I spent quite a bit of time on the Flathead Indian Reservation in Montana, where Salish Pondere, hanging in there by a thread, might just join, might very soon join, the long, long list of languages, soon to vanish from the earth. We've known language death here in Scotland, We've known how it was, perhaps in Unst, perhaps in Fuller, to be the last speaker of Norn. Known how it was, perhaps a thousand years ago, perhaps in Aberdeenshire, to be the last speaker of Pictish. Known how it was a good bit later, most probably in Lewis, to be the last of the many Hebrideans who through many generations spoke Norse. Pictish and Hebridean Norse were given up for reasons similar to those endangering Salish Ponderay. In Aberdeenshire, here in Skye, out there in Lewis, another language had acquired an overwhelming dominance. Spoken by aristocrats, by everyone who mattered, those in power. This language, at that time, being Gaelic. 
But back to where I started, with these lines from Askean Bau Otamis, a poem by Thomas Alexander Robertson, better known as Vagaland. The Norse name Vagaland for the part of Shetland that's now Walls, where Robertson was raised. When Vagaland made this poem in 1951, Shetland, economically, was very much a basket case, a place of mass unemployment, next to no prospects, runaway depopulation and outmigration. Unpropitious circumstances, you might think, for two ventures in which Vagaland was much involved. The establishment of a Shetland folk society and the launch of a quarterly periodical, the New Shetlander. The Folk Society's remit, laid down in 1945, was to collect and preserve what remained of Shetland's folklore, folk songs, fiddle tunes, traditions, customs, dialect. The New Shetlander, dating from 1947, had equivalent ambitions. An early editorial, and I quote, the dialect is an essential part of Shetland. Generation after generation has used it to express thoughts, feelings, joys, sorrows. The dialect has become part and parcel of the Shetlander. If it goes, he loses something vital. And there could be no commitment to Shetlandic, the magazine insisted, without, comment, without commitment to material improvement. This from another editorial. The faint-hearted spiritless ones may sell up and clear out, but the folk who intend to stick it out here under Aldrock will yet surprise and confound the critics and wiseacres. De Aldrock is, of course, Shetland itself. And so it proved. A Shetland Development Council took shape, evolving into Shetland Council of Social Service and recruiting as its secretary a young man soon doubling as something new in Scotland, a local authority development officer. To this young man, there was clear linkage, as the new Shetlander contended, between cultural regeneration and economic progress. His words, quote, the fact that Shetland was undeniably Shetland, and Shetlanders were so undeniably what they were, could perhaps be their greatest strength in this matter of development. The man who said this was Bob Story. Years later, when with the Highlands and Islands Development Board, he'd helped greatly to get this college going. His thinking here being thinking of the sort he'd set out on in Shetland. This notion that a community's capacity to shape its future is it's bound, bound up, up with its value, its, its culture, culture, its heritage. And I discovered last night, I didn't know this, uh, but I discovered last night from Norman Gillis that this annual lecture series is itself a brainchild, a suggestion of the late Bob Story. Well, Bob Story in 1962 took part in a Shetland delegation to the Faroe Islands. Its findings summed up by Tom Henderson, writer, storyteller, museum curator, and convener at that time of Shetland County Council. There's an energy, he wrote, there's an energy evident in Faroe which is lacking, not only in Shetland, but throughout the Highlands and Islands. One needs to move only casually amongst Faroese people to realise this, to realise that unlike Shetlanders, they possess unlimited confidence. The young folks stay on, and the man of means is not afraid to risk his capital in local investment. Well, before the 60s ended, Pharaoh had another visitor from Scotland, this one having interests here in Skye. Like Tom Henderson, he was impressed. He said this to me some time later. I've never been able to see why the West Highlands and Islands should be less prosperous than comparable places elsewhere. I'd been to Pharaoh, and I'd seen there an island community that was flourishing, both economically and culturally. The revival of their language started the Faroese on the upward path, and I was convinced that the revitalization of Gaelic would do the same for Skye and other parts of the West Highlands and Islands. People who believe in their language and culture will also believe in themselves. <laughs> 
The man who said these things was Ian Noble, so Morastig's founder. Well, in the later 1960s, when Ian Noble first spent time in Faro, and when Bob Story moved from Shetland to the Highland Board in Inverness, I was studying history at the University of Aberdeen. Aberdeen's head of history then was John Hargreaves. John, who'd worked in Sierra Leone, was one of the first academics to engage with the history of Africa's indigenous people. This was to do something widely thought a waste of time. As made clear by this comment from Hugh Trevor Roper, Regis Professor of History at Oxford, writing in 1965. This is for Julian, who's a great fan of Hugh Trevor Roper. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps in the future, he wrote, perhaps in the future there will be some African history to teach. But at present, there is none, or very little. There is only the history of Europeans in Africa. The rest is largely darkness, and darkness is not a subject for history. Trevor Roper, as it happens, was just as dismissive of Highlanders, but that is by the way. From John Hargraves, I learned of what it took to get to grips with Africa's past, as that past had been experienced by Africans, of how it was essential to look beyond the records of colonial administrations, to grapple with Arabic writings from the pre-colonial era, and with sources of a sort conventional history mostly disregarded, oral tradition, material culture, that sort of thing. Might this approach, I now began to wonder, have application in a Highland context? Might it help counter what it was that led to academic verdicts on the clearances, for instance, being so at odds, so at odds with what I'd heard from my own folk when growing up in a little place called Dura in North Argyll. Most academic accounts of the post coordinate highlands I discovered on going to university were dependent on what had been said by government, still more dependent often on the correspondence of landlords and their agents. To be reliant, to be so completely reliant on this stuff, I felt, was to be hopelessly one-sided. It was as if accounts of Africa had room only for the European, the external, the colonial dimension, which of course is what the new discipline of African history was setting out to overturn. And that's why, or partly why, when researching and writing a PhD thesis that became a book, The Making of the Crofting Community, as Joe referred, I attempted to make crofters, not lairds, not officialdom, key actors on the stage, to put them at the centre of their own history. In so doing, I drew to on E.P. Thompson's Making of the English Working Class, a book I've always valued greatly published, first of all, in the mid-1960s. And it was his title, in fact, obviously enough, I stole in part for my own writing. In that book, Thompson looks to rescue England's labouring folk from what he called, and it's a superb phrase, the enormous condescension of posterity. A lot of people in the Highlands and Islands were long subject to the enormous condescension of posterity as well. I wanted, with the confidence of youth, I was a, a lot younger then than I am now, I wanted, with the confidence of youth, to do the same for people who landlord-centred histories of the Highlands had reduced, I thought, to ciphers, folk on whom others simply worked their will. These people, I felt, could be shown to have possessed ambitions, aspirations, capabilities of their own. So that meant not stopping with the clearances. And at that time, as far as there was a lot of serious writing about a relatively recent Highland history, it tended to stop with the clearances. And I wanted to go a bit further and go on into the 1880s, to the land war that began in Brays here in Skye and in, and in Glendale also, of course, in Skye. Here's Angus Stewart from the Brays community of Penaharan. I cannot bear evidence to the distress of my people 
without bearing evidence to the oppression and high-handedness of the landlord and his factor. And Land League leader John McPherson from Lower Millevig in Glendale. It would be as easy to stop the Atlantic Ocean as to stop the present agitation until justice has been done to the people. When I was writing up the then neglected story of these times, I dared to hope, eh, somewhat ambitiously, that if folk knew a little more about them, knew how security of tenure was fought for and obtained, of how lost lands, or some of them, were finally won back, then people knowing this might get a wee bit of a boost. And that's why I got no end of a good feeling when in 1981 I first heard this from Rodenrig. But now there's a new day dawning. I've heard the brave men talk in Portree, the news from Glendale. Still the morning comes in on the land. See the new sun, red and rising. See the corn turn ripe in the fields and see the growth of the glen. And Macpherson's in Colmure tonight. What a night for a people rising. After the clans, after the queerings, here I am, recovering. I'm stuck with the lyrics because my singing voice is even shakier. <laughs> even shakier than my grip of a Shetlandic. So, but Donnie Monroe, who is with us, of course, this afternoon, Donnie Monroe has been kind enough to say that my stuff was one source of what it was that helped make Runrig. And if that's so, I'm truly flattered. <laughs> well, in the high ones I first knew way back in the 50s, 60s, a recovery seemed unlikely. Here's one assessment. The Highlands scene presents a picture of drift of the younger population to the towns, leaving behind a diminished and aging population, approaching a position at which it can no longer maintain itself. That was written in the Scottish office in June 1948, when I was three weeks old. And the 1950s wouldn't bring improvement. Prime Minister Harold Macmillan, Britain's Prime Minister then, could say of Britain that we'd never had it so good, with quite a degree of truth, actually. But from this boom, the Highlands and Islands stood apart. In 1953, Picture Post, which was Britain's then most widely read magazine, sent one of its journalists north. Our area's dwindling settlements, he reported, were symptomatic of the Highlands and Islands having become the United Kingdom's most gravely depressed area. 1955's West Highland Survey, that a remarkable compendium put together by Frank Frank Fraser Darling, made equally grim reading. And this is from West Highland Survey. Population decline has continued without a break in sky since 1841. In Slate, the population is down to a fifth of its maximum. Further decline in population is inevitable. Such decline duly occurred. In the mid-1840s, just before the potato famine, Skye's population was 25,000 or more. By the 1960s, it was under 7,000. And that trend seemed then likely to continue. Instead, of course, the opposite has happened. Skye's population today, at well over 10,000, is back to levels of 100 years ago. Slate, where there were 452 people in 1971, now has more than twice that number. So what was once the most depopulated part of a depopulating island isn't like that anymore. No small part of this is down to Solmar Ostig, to the incomes, the activity, the vitality this college has injected into Slate. And this local impact matters. But Solmar Ostig's wider impact matters more. So, Andrew. In the later 1970s, I worked for the Press and Journal. Uh, I still, for the last day, two or three years, have been writing the occasional column for the Press and Journal, and uh, I find that this sort of reversion back to where I started, as it were, really rather, rather good. 
But anyway, in the 70s, I was a features writer on, on the staff of the P&J, based in Aberdeen. And that was the most enjoyable job in many ways I've ever had. Not least because of my being able to report from here and there across the northern half of Scotland. The, these are some paragraphs, there are several paragraphs, I'm afraid, from a piece I wrote in 1979. The community cooperative at Ness in the northern part of Lewis is a success story. And success so stories are none too common in islands that have been among the most depressed districts in the United Kingdom. The people of Ness have organised their own business enterprise, the enterprise they call Cohoman Niche. The Cohoman's first annual report gives some indication of the range of its activities. An office and shop, the acquisition of building land, the supply of feeding stuffs and fertilizers, market gardening, a mobile snack bar, council house construction. So how did it all begin? From what source, I'm still quoting from my 1979 piece, from what source did this Hebridean crofting community derive the self-confidence needed to tackle the task of halting a century-old process of decay? Community education worker Annie MacDonald, actively involved in setting up Cohoman Niche, has a surprising answer. It all started, she says, with a job creation project designed to uncover the history of Ness. To begin with, people were skeptical about the worth of that particular project. But in the end, it helped revive our community's sense of identity. It made people look at their own past and realize what they had lost and it created a new sense of self-respect, a sense that our community, our language, and our culture had something well worthwhile to offer. Well, what I was told in this by Annie MacDonald, who is now and has been for some time Annie McSween, chimed with what I'd heard about Shetland, where in the 1970s I was a regular visitor. This is a quote from a Highland Board report of 1972. The high level of prosperity in Shetland has become almost a byword. But to those who knew Shetland in the circumstances of a decade or more ago, the present situation contains something unreal and miraculous. In contrast to the former depression, unemployment and stagnation, industries are at full stretch, labor not easy to get, and the drift of population arrested. This success was based on fishing, on fish processing, on knitwear. All on the back of what I touched on earlier, the drive by Tom Henderson, Bob Story, and lots of others, to engender a new confidence in Shetland. This confidence and outgrowth of what Annie called identity. I sort of labor this because nowadays, understandably, <laughs> there's a tendency to think that Shetland's always been a riotously prosperous sort of locality by Highlands and Highland standards, and that is not at all the case. And Shetland, having thus been set upon its feet in the way I've touched on, would matter hugely when, as happened early in the early 1970s, oil was found in the North Sea, much of it in what's called the East Shetland Basin. Because of the already buoyant economy, because of the collective self-belief that underpinned this buoyancy, Shetlanders were able to negotiate with the oil majors and with the UK government from a position of real strength. Which meant that Shetland gained, there's a story told of, uh, which sums this up, there's a story told that I've heard in Shetland, it may have grown slightly in the telling, but it encapsulates truth. And it's about the, the very earliest negotiations with the then Shetland Council, the Shetland County Council, to set up what's become the Sullenville Oil Terminal. And a delegation from Shetland was summoned, so to speak, to meet the major oil company representatives. And this was held in, I think, the Shell or BP boardroom in London, some such place. And the Oil company Haidin, one of the chairs who was chairing the meeting, began by saying that he wanted to make clear that they didn't have to bring the oil ashore in Shetland, that there were alternatives. And the leader of the Shetland negotiation, negotiating team 
at that point just stood up, gathered his papers together and said, well, if that's the case, we don't need to be here and walked out <laughs> or attempted to walk out and they had to call him back. And the ability to actually take that sort of line with the oil companies was, I'm afraid, sadly lacking just about everywhere else in Britain, but it was there in Shetland. And so that meant that Shetland gained, by way of its oil fund, all sorts of long-term assets, first-class leisure centres, a museum, a library, an archive, and much else. And what occurred in Shetland has been mirrored, I think anyway, in Ness. The job creation project launched in 1977 would result in the formation of Kamenechtri Niche, which both survives and prospers. The Kamenechtri, a history society of course, having now its own museum, library, archive, cafe and much else. That's important, but of still more significance, as Annie McSween told me more than 40 years ago, has been the Kamenechtri's contribution to what Annie called a sense of self-respect. This fueled, Annie said, Cahoma Niche. More recently, it's underpinned the Ness community's purchase and highly successful management of the 55,000 acre Gulson estate. No accident then that at key moments in the purchase process, Agnes Rennie, a lead actor in that process, reached back to the Land League and to what the League had accomplished in Lewis and further afield. To be aware, to know of past endeavor of the Land League sort, is, I think, in this sort of context, an assurance of being able to do things that might otherwise seem unachievable. If they could do these things in such adverse circumstances way back then, what are we, as it were, worrying about today? And there's linkage here, I guess, with my brief studies of the history of Africa. And especially with a book these studies brought to my attention. It's an anti-colonial classic. It's by Franz, Franz Fanon, who came from Martinique, a free French army veteran, active in Algeria's independence struggle. In 1961, while dying of leukemia, he'd write Les Damnés de la Terre, The Wretched of the Earth, including this. Colonialism, not satisfied with holding a people in its grip, turns to the past of the oppressed people and distorts, disfigures and destroys it. The total result looked for is to convince the natives that colonialism came to lighten their darkness. But what Fanon called this theory of pre-colonial barbarism was demolished, Fanon says, when colonialism's victims began themselves to look into their history. Here's Fanon. It was with the greatest delight they discovered there was nothing to be ashamed of in the past, but rather dignity, glory, and solemnity. And then, I admit that all the proofs of a wonderful Songhai civilization will not change the fact that today the Songhai are underfed and illiterate, thrown between sky and water with empty heads and empty eyes. But this, Franz Fanon argues, is beside the point. By rediscovering, in Fanon's phrase, the dignity long hidden from them, colonized nations, Fanon says, move closer to their liberation. West Africans may not have gained materially from knowing that the Songhai ancestors had ministered a great and African-created kingdom. But the same Africans, on learning this, could not again be party to the notion that they were inherently incapable of taking charge of their own destiny. From ideas of that sort stems my conviction that here in the Highlands and Islands as in Africa, a prerequisite to progress has consisted, still consists, of challenging externally imposed and all too often negative interpretations of our past. Now the Highlands and Islands were not colonized as Africa was colonized. But from the Middle Ages onwards, when the Highlands and Islands were being integrated, often forcibly, into the, first the Scottish and then the British state, the people overseeing this process made it their business, just like their colonizing counterparts, to denigrate, devalue, and dehumanize our area's inhabitants. When you extend your jurisdiction over others, 
whether you're an Edinburgh-based monarch looking to control the Hebrides, or a London-based minister trying to justify your country's ever-growing empire. You aim to convince yourself, as much as anyone else, you aim to convince yourself that you're bringing to the folk you've conquered not, not just a new, but a superior order. Prior to your taking charge, you say, the territories you've seized were steeped in backwardness. Only with your coming was there, could there be enlightenment. And we all were all aware of attempts to justify imperialism, past and relatively more recent, in just these terms. And from the 15th century to the 19th, external attitudes to people here in the Highlands and Islands were shot through with just such thinking. Hence Patrick Seller, who did so much to organize the Sutherland Queerances. Hence Patrick Seller on the barbarous hordes he helped eject from Sutherland. While these modes of thought would linger, with generation after generation here in the Highlands and Islands being told by folk in authority that everything about them, starting with the Gaelic language, was inferior, second rate, of no account. Developmentally, this was disastrous, for reasons that John Murder, land reformer, Gaelic activist, and long one of my heroes, set out in 1883. The language and lore of the Highlanders being treated with despite has tended to crush their self-respect. When a man was convinced that his language was a barbarism, what remained that he should struggle for? As Murdoch commented, when your supposed inadequacy is constantly dinned into you, you can't but end up lacking self-esteem. And where there isn't self-esteem, there can't be enterprise, initiative, advancement. Hence our continuing requirement to encourage individuals and communities to take pride in their background, to feel good about themselves and their surroundings, to show that the Highlands and Islands, once dismissed as hopelessly impoverished, are actually rich in music, architecture, literature, archaeology, to insist that the Highlands and Islands, so well endowed in these respects, are equally endowed with natural resources, are even wealthier environmentally, to demonstrate that this locality can offer all its people a high quality of life. That, to return to a ski and bow, a ski and bow Tammies, folk were about in 1940s, 50s Shetland, that's what they were about. And that's what they've been about in Ness and lots of other places, not least this one. There are various indicators of the resulting impact, business startups, growing numbers in employment, interest in traditional music, the fashion mu movement, local development trusts, more and more land and community ownership. Much of this stems, I think, from a new faith in folks' capacity to make things happen. Consider in this context the findings of a 2018 survey of 3,000 plus young people, mostly in the teens and twenties, drawn from across the area served by HIE, Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Nine out of every ten describe themselves as proud of their communities. A majority would like to make their lives here. Then comes this. Almost 70% agree that people who stay in the Highlands and Islands are lucky to be able to work or study locally. That's not how people of my age group felt about those still at home when we were heading off. So more at Osteg, I reckon, is both a product and a cause of in attitudinal changes of this sort. What's been created here, what happens here, is testimony to the now being opportunities that not far back did not exist. There's cause here to be hopeful. In saying this, I'm conscious that action is still required. To get to grips, for instance, with, with what's a housing crisis a crisis jeopardizing much of what's been gained, impacting on young people most of all. Your Kilbeg initiative is most welcome in this context, but more, far more is requiring to be done, especially by government. And what of something central to your mission, the long-term health of Gaelic? 
not least in localities where Gaelic's an everyday language, that health remains precarious. Something uh, underlined by yesterday's report about the chronic shortage of Gaelic medium teachers. And all of that, of course, needs stressing and it needs a response. But also worth stressing is the progress that's been made. In a recent study of public policy as it's affected Gaelic, Wilson MacLeod cites words used in 1958 by Kenneth Jackson, professor of Celtic at the University of Edinburgh. By 2050, Jackson thought, Scots Gaelic would be, in his words, quite extinct having gone the way of Norn and Pictish, the way of language death. That won't happen. Sure, Gaelic's future is by no means guaranteed, but that bleakest of bleak prophecies from 1958 has been confounded, not least because of this place. Back now to my title, to that line from a Skian Bo Atami's, Lake de Laverick et de I chose that for personal reasons. A, a laverick, of course, it's, 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 it tends to be pronounced differently in Shetland, but it's Scots word laverick, meaning a skylark. And this notion of a skylark singing high above evokes for me what's long been my favorite island setting, a Uist macher in the early weeks of summer, when it's not at all the way it is outside just now. <laughs> with the macher carpeted in flowers with its color, scents, wind, sun, and bird song. All of that can't fail to lift your spirits. Much as my conviction of there being a good future still for the highlands, for the islands, is always boosted by a visit here to Solmore. It was my privilege to give the first of these Solmore Austin lectures in 1990, 32 years ago. Should you ask me back in a further 32 years, <laughs> In the somewhat unlikely event of my still being around at 106, <laughs> what might I find? That Kilbeg, your new built settlement in this place where in the clearing times so many settlements were swept away. That Kilbeg is more populous and still expanding. That Solmore Ostig, this transformative institution, continues to amaze with a larger student body, bigger staff, a growing campus, a more extensive syllabus, and a new status, one that maintains, I trust, some close linkage with the University of the Highlands and Islands, but embodies recognition of the result of the remit and the purpose that makes Solmore Ostig so distinctive. And already, if one looks a wee bit further afield in Scotland, there's a precedent for some such recognition in the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland which is firmly inside the Scottish higher education sector, but with its own cash allocation, its own degree awarding powers in areas like music, film, dance, drama, arts production. In the sphere of Gaelic language, Gaelic culture, history, heritage in the widest sense of these terms, Solmore occupies a role analogous, I think, to that of the Conservatoire and surely merits the same treatment. So Morostig, to speak plainly, needs to be seen, needs to be funded as Scotland's Gaelic University. Should you go down that road, and that's for you, not me, should you go down that road, you'll run up against, I guess, no end of difficulty. But that's no reason for you to limit your ambitions. There's much that's good that's taught here. But perhaps the lesson of most consequence derives from your own story, from what at Solmore has been accomplished. This lesson being that nothing, absolutely nothing, should be thought impossible.
very much. Um, I don't think we would expect anything less than an inspiring talk from you, and you've certainly uh, given us that. Inspiring, thought-provoking in many ways, and we're really grateful to you um, to take the time out to come here. Um, the other thing I'd like to thank you for is for absolutely sticking to the time. <laughs> <laughs> so that means that we do have time for questions. And um, if you have a question or indeed a remark to make um, about what you've heard from Jim, um, then can you raise your hand? Um, these lights are very, very bright and I may not see you. So if I don't see you, then um, stand up and wave your arms. So I'm seeing somebody just... Oh, Hanyal Case Jackham, sir. I Hanyal Case Jackham, sir. Hanyal Case No, I've just got the microphone. Oh, you've just got the microphone. I thought you wanted to ask a question. El Kesh Jack Dingus, does anyone have a question? A stunned silence. A stunned silence. Um, Shona, and maybe you would be so good as to introduce, let us know who you are, yeah. at least your name. Feskrama, Smisher Shona Nikolinen, Ken of Rorn Gaelic, and I'd like to thank Jim for a very, very inspiring speech. I was present at the lecture in 1990, and I think, obviously, um, strongly support your sentiments. What I would also be quite interested to hear is your thoughts on those links between language revival and that other um, campaign that you have been on for so long about land reform. Because I think the two are hugely connected in terms of confidence, community growth, language growth, and opportunities to revive areas which had suffered for so long. So if you would be willing to say a short piece <laughs> <laughs> on that, I, I would really appreciate that. I, I was actually the colic when I stood up uh, that uh, I always remember addressing an audience, I think uh, even larger than, than this one, way back when I was chairing HIE. 20 plus years ago, and was asked by the then uh, Scottish uh, government, I think Donald Dewar was, still, was then the First Minister still, uh, to, to go and say something in favour of land reform at a conference convened by the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. <laughs> and so the audience consisted predominantly of land agents and factors and people like that. So I, I hope I have a slightly friendly audience today, but uh, I, I, I uh, began, well, I was first up, which didn't make it any easier. And uh, the, I was on just after the standard announcement about what everybody was to do if the building caught fire. And I said in a desperate attempt, ill-judged, to lighten the mood, that there were many people in the Highlands and Islands who thought that if a room full of factors and land agents caught fire, <laughs> they, should, they should all stay exactly where they were. <laughs> this, this did not go down with the light-hearted acclaim that I was looking for. So, so yes, I've been involved in these matters, as, as you say, for a rather long time. I do think there's a close connection, because I do think that uh, you know, as I, as I tried to say, there's a connection between not just l language revival, but cultural regeneration in a wider sense, and taking a, a legitimate pride in so much that was devalued in the past, that there's a close connection between that and uh, uh, people having the confidence to do all sorts of things, whether it's start a business, or indeed more collectively, perhaps, to embark, for instance, on community ownership of land, which is a, a huge uh, challenge. It's sometimes presented in the media as kind of dead easy, you know, all these people just wanted to take over a chunk of land. 
but it's very, very difficult. It involves an awful lot of effort and commitment. And people will not get into that, I think, unless they themselves have that inherent, not just individual self-confidence, but a kind of collective self-confidence in themselves as a community. And so I think it's, it's no coincidence that uh, the move towards greater land reform of that kind, the expansion of community ownership, has kind of gone alongside and been bound up very often. I, I mentioned the case of Ness and Lewis, for instance. It's been bound up very closely often with a equivalent, with measures going on or activity going on at the same time to have more confidence in the background language culture of the communities involved. So I think, uh, I think there is a close connection. I think much more requires to be done it's a hugely difficult area, and it, it's particularly the case now because we are seeing, for a whole variety of reasons that I won't get into, the price of land has become astronomical. And land purchases, community land purchases that I was involved with on the margins in various ways way back in the 1990s and the first decade of this century it, I think a lot of them wouldn't happen now, not because people wouldn't want them to happen, but because they couldn't afford to acquire the land. And so there is a huge challenge there. And I, I do think that the that authorities in Scotland, the Scottish government particularly, do need to step up their game in this area as in many others, because they, it, it does require action of a sort that only government can undertake. And I touched also, and didn't go into detail on that, you know, I, I think it's kind of heartbreaking almost, well not almost, it is heartbreaking to hear this, so many stories of young folk in this area and further afield, not just in the Highlands and Islands, but across rural Scotland, who would dearly like to be involved actively in their communities and do various things. And all of that's being stymied simply because they can't find anywhere affordable to live. And that, that I think, as I indicated, is actually the biggest developmental challenge facing the Highlands and Islands and some other areas today. It's much more needful even than action on job creation. You can have jobs, but nobody to fill them. We know all too often of instances of that. So there's a lot, yes, that requires to be done. You did say I should talk briefly, and I haven't. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's okay. Evelyn, who is sitting in front of me, because of occasion, when I was approached by somebody from the BBC, I don't think it was shown, because <laughs> they wanted to know about the history of the Liberal Party in the Highlands. And the chap said, do you know very much about that? And I said, well, not really. And he said, and Evelyn said, that won't stop him speaking about it for half an hour. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Uh, the your question. Um, Mark, in the front row. Uh, Mark Ringe, uh, programme lead for two of our degrees here. And Jim, you're always a lift to us when you come here, so it's good to hear it's mutual. Um, the idea of a higher education university status establishment in the Highlands and Islands has been around for a very long time. Um, you know, as you're aware, I'm, I'm quite sure, it was a man from Breckish, a Gaelic writer, Angus Robertson, who was at the front of trying to raise funds in the 1930s, mainly in the United States, to establish uh, a university status college uh, in Iona, was the plan then. And I happened to be reminded of that last night because I was reading a book by uh, uh, a 1933 book from, uh, by H.V. Morton, London journalist, whose son was the best school teacher I ever had. Um, uh, and he mentions Angus Robinson in there. The higher education establishment in Northern Scotland in the 1930s then was utterly different to what it is now. There wasn't really a, a basis on which to build. So I wonder if you'd be willing to say a bit more about that. Well, well, I do think that clearly the, the situation has, as you say, moved forward quite 
dramatically compared to what it was then, or even, you know, not just in the 1930s, but much more recently than that. And, uh, and uh, sorry, <laughs> it, uh, it, uh, it's bad enough talking at length if nobody can, if nobody can hear you, there's not much <laughs> point. But uh, the, clearly the situation has changed uh, radically and for, for the better. And I've, I've been involved, uh, or I was involved from its inception in the campaign for what's now the University of the Highlands and Islands. And that, that represents a huge step forward in this regard. And the reason, I suppose, I think that there's need to go a little bit further with regard to what happens here at Solmar Ostig is simply because it's not that what UHI is doing is in some sense not sufficient, but what you do here is unique, not just in a UHI context, but in a Scottish and indeed global context, that you're teaching uh, to a high level and people are being enabled to conduct research to a high level through the medium of Gaelic. And Gaelic, as we all know, uh, remains highly endangered. And I think it would therefore, there is a case in my view, not for some sort of breakaway as it were from UHI or some sort of civil war within UHI, but a, for there to be recognition that just as with the conservatoire, the conservatoire in Glasgow doesn't pose any kind of threat academically to the universities of Glasgow and Strathclyde and so on. It's simply, it's there because of a recognition that there is an area of higher education which they conduct, which uh, requires an institution that specializes in that and that it is its own funding stream and its own recognition. And I think in the area of Gaelic language and everything else associated with that, there's an equal case to be made for that sort of recognition. And I guess that's what I meant. It's a, of course, not, it's not for me, especially at my age, to get into campaigning for that or anything else, but uh, it, uh, it's, it's something I think that perhaps by yourselves and others needs to be thought about. Thank you, Jim. I am over on the left, gentlemen, Spiaklana, farm up. Thank you. Quickly repeat, Bob Jones, formerly Head of Design and Interpretation for the GB Forestry Commission. Question is in two parts. Uh, firstly, I'm afraid for the, may I call you the Hygians of Saul Moore, um, how wedded are you to the exclusive delivery of your syllabus in Gaelic? And I'm thinking here about the future of Saul Moore, and I do understand the vision of being noble. If the answer to that question is um, wholly uh, committed to that delivery, then the second question, and I do aim more to James Hunter, and, and that is, we've heard today from you about other cultures across the Highlands, um, whether it's Highlands and Islands, I should say, whether it's Shetland, Nordic, Pict, whatever, Viking. My interest is in the second of my previous duties, that is interpretation, as in the context of explaining the meaning of things and stuff. I believe that 
Language can't exist really in isolation. It is part of the culture and of its society, and the Highlands, bless them, if they have nothing else, have many societies and many cultures. Could it be that Saul Moore could become a focus for that? Thank you. Well, uh, well, uh, well, the first thing I should say is I'm, I'm not speaking for or on behalf of Saul Moore Astig. So uh, it's used as to how the college, which uh, the people involved with the college wish to take the college forward are not for me, so I'm not going to address these. I think, uh, yes, clearly, as I touched on, and there are others also, but there are a variety of uh, cultures, language, heritages, and all the rest uh, across the wider highlands and islands. And uh, I particularly cited, for various reasons, Shetland. And, uh, yeah, I can see the, the point you're making. However, and this I stress is my opinion, it's, it's, not, it's not on behalf of anyone else. Uh, I would hesitate to think that you could, well, you could obviously have an institution that dealt with all of these things. And arguably, UHI is that institution, or if it isn't, it ought to be. And uh, that, uh, that what I think, however, is a, what I was saying, because I was focused on Saul Morostic and what I think it's accomplished. And, you know, to me anyway, and not just to me, it's an inspiring place. And I think, if I could express a view on that in English, uh, I think it would be a serious error for Saul Morostig to in any way depart from its commitment to teaching and conducting study entirely through the medium of Gaelic. Because I think if that were to happen, then something that is precious and potentially critical, I think, to the future of the language and culture that Saul Morastig is about would be lost. So, as I say, it's not for me to say what Saul Morastig should do, but I can totally understand why people at Saul Morastig would be reluctant, I think, to go down that road. But the wider UHI is something entirely different. And uh, just as at the moment Saul Morastig is an integral par partner of UHI, and deals with what it deals with. There's absolutely no reason why other component parts of UHI shouldn't address, and, and they do address, the, the equivalent heritages, cultures, languages, dialects of their own localities. And I think that is already happening, and hopefully it will happen further. Thanks very much. Don't worry, I'm Stuart, uh, uh, lecturer, lecturer at Soma Rostic. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Jim. I suppose I should better put Bob's mind at rest that we do, we do speak English as well and we give courses and we give lectures and we, we were interviewed on radio and television, everybody here, uh, to get the, not just get the message out, but also to, to win friends for so and get people interested in what we do. But uh, I suppose one thing which I'd just like to ask you, Jim, is what do we do for what happens after the crofting community is made, how to explain the 20th century in, of, of Highland history to a new generation who might not know about the names of people who, who certainly should be you know, shouted from the rooftops, such as John Murdoch that you mentioned, uh, Thomas Murchison, uh, and many, many others right up to the present day. Uh, where do we move once we've got beyond the clans, once we've got beyond the clearances? What do we do now to try to enthuse a new generation in more recent Thailand history, which may well have something a bit more relevant to their own situation in 2022? Yeah, thanks, Donald. I, I, I actually think that's a really important question. I, I wouldn't uh, aspire to provide the answer 
particularly since uh, Joe won't let me speak for more than three seconds at a time. But, <laughs> but, uh, but I, do, uh, I do think that's, that's really, really important. I, and I'm well aware of that myself. And of course, I'm now of an age when uh, you know, I, I remember uh, a lot of these people. And, uh, and remember how in many cases I was influenced by them. But there is a need, I agree totally with that, there's certainly a need for people to be writing up, as it were, the more recent history of the highlands and islands. And uh, an awful lot of that hasn't been tackled and hasn't been done. So there's, there's, there's a real job for people there to do that. Uh, again, moving away from this locality and this area, as it were, back to Shetland. The story I touched on as to how Shetland came to be the way Shetland is, starting in the post-war years, that's a story that's never really been written up, not in Shetland or anywhere else. And there are all sorts of equivalent uh, tales to be told and issues explored and just how many things that we now take for granted were accomplished. And it's not just what was happening at a grassroots level with pressure from people in, in regard to all sorts of things, but the way that there was a whole variety of institutions that were a result of that, or partly a result of that, the one, that, the one that I regard as little short of heroic is the Hydro Board. And uh, nobody now much knows the story of the Hydro Board. And uh, if, if, they, if they think about the Hydro Board at all, it's, uh, it's perhaps in relation to the fact that until very recently, when, it, when, it suddenly, when suddenly the bill started coming from OVO, that there was still a tendency for bills to be labelled Scottish Hydro. Uh, and, uh, but of course the Hydro Board itself ceased to exist in the Thatcher period when it was privatised. But, but, you know, people talk today about the need to have super fast broadband everywhere and all of that. And of course that, that is a pressing need and a hugely important need. But the challenge, the technical challenges and the cost relatively in relation to that are as nothing compared to the challenge of getting electricity into virtually every home, however far away from a main road or whatever in the highlands and islands. Something that was accomplished in the late 40s, 1950s and into the 1960s by the Hydro Board. And I suppose I'm a wee bit sentimental about this because one of my earliest memories, dating from 1953, when I was four turning five, is of the night or the evening when my father came home from his work with the Forestry Commission. And he must, he must have known that this was, this was the day when this was due to happen because our house had been wired up and everybody had no doubt and Dura was talking about it. And he came in and he sat down and my sister, who at the time would have been three, my sister and I flicked a switch and all of a sudden the room was lit up by what we called for ages afterwards electric light. <laughs> and, and the paraffin lamps and the tilly lamps and the candles were relegated well, they weren't relegated entirely because they were pretty frequent power cuts, <laughs> but, but they were effectively relegated. Now, the story of that and how it was achieved and the people who pressed for it and the heroic stature of government ministers at the time like Tom Johnson, Secretary of State for Scotland in Winston Churchill's wartime government, who had cut his teeth on land reform issues and uh, who was a instrumental in setting up the Hydro Board and who was so committed to making it happen. All of that sort of thing does require to be known about because it, it rather underscores that often today's governments aren't half as committed or even a tenth as committed to making betterment happen in places like the Highlands and Islands. And people need to know, I think, 
that things that, like that could be done and were done in the past. And they need to know that the struggles that they are engaged in with regard to housing and the like, that they, they, there were parallel struggles in the past. And it's not surely beyond the wit of government, but it, does, it will require pressure from the grassroots, organized pressure to really tackle, and it hasn't been done so far, to really tackle the issue of housing. Because housing is just so utterly fundamental. And if we don't, in the next 10, 15 years, get to grips with housing the way that the Hydro Board got to grips with the provision of electricity, and don't let any obstacles stand in our way, then uh, so much of what I talked about that has been achieved, so much of the progress that's been made, will be jeopardized because you can't have progress without young folk in communities able to make lives for themselves in places like this and to have adequate housing to do these things in. And at the moment, that's just not available. It's not happening and it's awful. And that's the sort of issue, I think, that we need to be connecting with what people were doing, not just in the past I was talking about in the 1880s, but in the course of the 20th century as well. We have to be doing that. Thank you very much, Jim. I'm sure most of us would agree with you, um, especially living here, um, that housing is, is one of the huge challenges we face, not just in this community, but in many communities. Now, once again, I would really like to thank you sincerely on behalf of Solmore. Um, Gillian's going to say a few words as well, but before that, could you please show your appreciation? Tarple of the Harjan. Well, first of all, Jim, I would quite like to take you up on your offer of giving the next Solmore Ostig lecture in 32 years' time. <laughs> I can't guarantee I'll be here myself, but I'm delighted if you are. Seriously, though, Jim, thank you for giving us a, a truly inspiring lecture as part of the Solmore Ostig series tonight. Um, you have brought together many of the things that I think feed our intellects, but in feed our imaginations and touch us emotionally. You've pulled on poetry, quotes from poetry, song. I was sorry not to hear you sing. You're very lucky, didn't you? <laughs> of course, from historical accounts, from your rich and varied development experience, and also, obviously, from your vision. And for that, we thank you very much indeed. There were, I'm, I'm somebody um, who, in my own life, I've collected proverbs, although I have a love-hate <laughs> relationship with proverbs, and I'm a bit the same when it comes to quotes. But there were so many quotes tonight that stood out to me as being truly inspiring, and that I would like myself to remember when we go back to the office tomorrow morning and start to think about uh, our future Solmorostic strategy 2023 to 28. You said, there's cause here to be hopeful. And you said, nothing, absolutely nothing, should be thought impossible. So thank you for these words of wisdom, which we will take with us as we move forward. Thank you very much once again. Anisham Maha Harjan, um, thank you very much for being part of the Orich tonight, or this afternoon, I should say. It feels like night because it's dark. Um, we are very pleased to invite you all to come for a drink in the atrium. We are blessed with the hospitality offered by Ferran Ilan Earmen. So please, can you join us in the atrium uh, afterwards? Thank you.